Give me a second. Okay. I'll start my comments again. Um, so, all right. so I think this book, um, there's two main topics. The first is on the lawlessness. And I'd say that the, the first half really makes the case of which all the ways in which CBP and ICE have been allowed, and I wanna just like focus on that word allowed, um, to work outside the norms of US law um, and other norms and laws um, that other agencies have to follow. So it really discusses all these different ways that I don't think people know that um, ICE and CBP don't have to follow like Fourth Amendment protections and due process protections um, that are just really so critical when we think about um, what we what we think about as our rights as citizens. And I think it also does a pretty good job of explaining how this affects us as citizens. The second half of the, the book talks about the history and traces the history of this out. Um, and this, both the history of enforcement and the history of illegality um, and what illegality means and how much it is predicated on the law and how the law changes and not necessarily behavior by anybody has changed um, who is and who is not um, eligible for legal entry and um, permanent residency and all those good things down the line um, is really just about these changes in the law. And she highlights a couple really important moments like 1929 and then of course the mid nineties um, with welfare reform and ARERA and all of the mid nineties reforms. I'd also like to highlight two major themes that are running out the book. Um, the first is the pathologies of bureaucracy theme um, that we talk about, at least in international relations, with thinking more about international NGOs and international um, or organizations. But we can also think about within domestic politics, where you have bureaucracies who want to increase their own um, wealth, their own um, stature in government, their own, um, the size of their budgets, and how much CBP and ICE and other enforcement um, air groups um, have really pushed on highlighting undocumented immigration as the threat so that they can increase their own budgets and their own importance. So when you think about, you know, we don't always think about bureaucracy as being its own agent, but here it's really a ca good case. So if you need, if you're like, I need an example of a pathological bureaucracy, this is really good for you. The other major theme is one that I think is really um, exciting uh, to think about is the, is the tension between this norm of settlement equaling citizenship in the United States and the, and the white nationalism, white supremacy that she talks about. So in the presentation, Elizabeth didn't talk as much about um, the role that white nationalism, white supremacy plays in creating these laws. Um, but it really pays, plays a really big role, as most people probably know, in the creation of first the national origin quotas, and then even the change to um, uh, family reunification. And then also as we think about this role of enforcement and pushing this norms of enforcement forward, especially around if we think about like what, what else was going on in the mid 90s. So she recommends at the end of the book, a return to this registry to a return to allowing um, individuals who've been settled for a while to um, gain status. And I just wanna tell an anecdote about this because um, this past summer, I was talking to some people who were on the Biden campaign and were writing up the, the white papers that went into his plan. And I was like, okay, so you're going to do an amnesty, but what are we going to do for people who are undocumented in the future? And they're like, well, we're just going to solve legal immigration. So there's no more undocumented people. And I was like, are you kidding? Are you effing kidding me? Like, come on. Like, you know, that like, that's not, the, that's not what is going to happen. There's always going to be people who need to regularize their status. Um, and especially as Elizabeth was hiding, hi, highlighting, is that if we're going to reform the H-2A visas and other um, temporary visa programs, you know, Biden wants to have a path to citizenship for those individuals, but what if that doesn't pass? Like, what's going to happen to those individuals? Or we still want to hold, have TPS, but now there's people who've been under TPS for, you know, 20 years now plus. And so you're like, shouldn't at some point we think, 
you know, it is no longer temporary protected status. It needs to be full, you know, status. And also she makes this really interesting argument that we need, so this goes to like her comments about whether or not you are open borders or not. It's just the, that we need to roll back the laws and by, roll back it, by rolling back the laws, we will have, um, enforcement will have less to do. And by having less to do, it will then um, lose its need to exist to the same extent which I thought was a really interesting idea and one that I think definitely comes from a theorist and not necessarily from an empiricist like myself. I wouldn't have necessarily thought about that angle. Um, so I have a couple of questions or thoughts. Um, one is, especially in the, in the 90s, um, I guess I wanted a little bit more links between um, how white nationalism pushes the enforcement agenda um, in comparison to the law and order agenda that we see going on at the same time. And I think they're actually part and parcel of the same thing. So in addition to Elizabeth's book highlights the like 1980s Reagan welfare reforms that then go into the 90s, um, you know, the tropes about who's a welfare queen as being very racialized. If we think about the law and order frame too, that was highly racialized, um, discussions of super predators, that sort of thing was all highly racialized. Um, and so I think just connecting that a little bit more um, would have been um, helpful. And then for some reason, not all my comments uh, saved. Um, and so then I just wanted to think about as the last thought um, for this group and for Elizabeth um, and just in general, is, is reform possible of these agencies? So my, and my thing about that is she really nicely traces how the Border Patrol in particular has just been a lawless organization since like the beginning of its, yeah. of its creation. And so even though we know that some people who are end up as CBP agents end up because the CBP pays really well and has good benefits and it's like the only good thing going at their border town um, or like the best job going their border town. But we also know that lots of people select into it. And so can we actually reform the culture at all? Do we need to basically fire everybody and start over? Um, how might we think about that? Um, and, and just thinking about whether reform in this space is possible. Then I guess one last comment is on the public opinion side, I was trying to think about how this would work because what I hear from former Obama officials is, you know, they did a lot of the enforcement because they said, you know, the Republicans were always like, we have to secure our borders first. They said, okay, let's secure our borders first and then let's try to do reform. Um, and that didn't work. So is there ever, is there, how do we redo public opinion? How do we move people forward such that um, we can get out of this enforcement first mindset and actually focus on reform. Thank you. Um, actually, probably should engage you to give my book talk because you pulled out so much important stuff that after you said it, I was like, why didn't I say that? Um, so thank you so much. And of course, thank you for your kind words and for giving me an opportunity to bring back some of the material that I had sidelined into the discussion. Um, so yeah, I, I would like to start with your question about white supremacy. And you know, one of the things I bring into the picture in the book is like, I think um, there is this image we have of white supremacy in the United States of being like the um, tool or um, comfort or kind of, um, uh, you know, place of, of last resort for people who have experienced disenfranchisement or who are disadvantaged or who view themselves as being in some way low status um, or treated as if they're low status. And a really interesting pattern to me is that from 1924 20, onward, which is really the period that I talk about, the people um, pushing the white supremacy angle or the white power angle um, at the outset are almost always highly educated, affluent, high status elites. So it was, you know, Harvard and Princeton educated people in the 1920s. 
And when it comes back, right, we see people like um, John Tanton getting melon money. John Tanton is, is you know, an ophthalmologist <laughs> person with a, an, an MD who is, is affiliated with a bunch of organizations, some of which are remain reputable, um, like Sierra Club, just pushing, pushing, pushing on a public that in general, even to this day, when asked reasonably worded questions about immigration, likes the idea of immigration and feels positively disposed towards immigrants, immigrants living in the United States. Um, so, so there's this way in which, you know, already powerful people are using white supremacy and then trying to bring less powerful people along so that they have a larger base of, um, of public opinion to, to champion white supremacist measures and legislation. I think uh, this then uh, draws us into the question you asked, which is like, okay, so what happens? And um, I, I think probably, right, there's this strain of elite white nationalism um, and white supremacy that we see like even in the opening in 1965, right? So the people creating family reunification really thought this was going to be used to bring more Europeans into the United States. And um, that will show you, I think, that the Ivy League education many of us has doesn't apply you common sense because um, that's not what happened. But, you know, you only have to fast forward like 15 years and you're seeing just a lot of panic um, in the form of the war on drugs, which is inextricable from the early, early stages of the buildup of mass incarceration. And war on drugs really quickly becomes a discussion about, um, about border borders and border patrol and what we can do to stop the movement of stuff and the people that bring that stuff. So already even like in, in the late 70s, early 80s, if you look at like the presidential commission, they were talking in language that was very much um, carceral and enforcement oriented. And, um, you know, it's always surprising to my students that, that the, the am it's only amnesty we've really ever had, mass amnesty, ERCA was, was generated under Republican, Republican leadership, but like that was still a moment in which the overall idea, much like 1929, was we do this so that we can then, in, going forward, enforce better, enforce better, we'll fix our mistake and then we'll enforce better. And at the time it was drugs and then, um, and you see it in popular culture, right? There's all this reinforcement in movies, um, Scarface, and all, all, all of these things people are seeing. And then uh, we have the first attack on the World Trade Center. And then like this kind of also racialized view of national security gets pulled into the picture and you see some of the organizations that Tanton founded um, or helped found get into the business of like talking about threat, speaking about threat coming from a variety of different places, not just now drugs and guns, but also um, terrorist threats to people's security, which I think we now know mostly come from within the United States. Um, but but it, it's constantly this elite-driven, well-resourced movement to, to make people afraid. Um, and, and so, like, to, to answer, I, I have a couple other things to say, but like, to answer your last question, I really like was told, and I'm not sure how I feel about this, but I was told when I wrote this book by um, the people who I was working with, like a, a, a well-selling book on politics makes people afraid. <laughs> and I didn't really like that general principle, but the answer to your question, I think, how do we get people to kind of um, public opinion to back away from what they've been told about law and order and enforcement is to really, make them recognize that we all, regardless of our citizenship status, have something to be afraid of if we have this large and out of control a police force in the United States with powers that no other police have, a lot of money, a lot of weapons, a lot of power. Um, 
so and this I felt like I could be an exception of in the my general principle that you should be making people afraid because I think we should be afraid of ICE and Customs and Border Protection. Um, and I, I could say a lot more. I'll just say one more thing though, and that's in response to your question about like, can we really fix um, these agencies? And you're right. Uh, border Patrol work itself, which is under Customs and Border Protection, has always been a problem. It was a problem before we created a Border Patrol. I mean, there were really, as I'm sure many of you know, really violent, basically pogroms, um, in some cases carried out by like Texas Rangers at the, you know, before we had Border Patrol, there was this type of stuff happening. Um, and I think, you know, like Reese Jones has a book by this title, but like borders are violent places. Um, they're places where violence happens and they generate other types of violence that's not happening necessarily in their proximity. So in one sense, borders are violent and no, we can't um, fix any anything that has to do with borders if borders themselves are violent. But um, we can, first of all, like DHS is a disaster. It was obviously a disaster from the outset. It's a very new organization. It's only been around since 2002 and everybody knew it was a rush job at the time, even though it was the biggest reorganization of the federal government since um, the Department of Defense was created. Like we don't have to have a DHS. We can back away from that. Um, it's hard for people to imagine, but it is a new agency. So we can undo some of the damage that we've done. And if we fix 96, as people like to say, right? If we can back away from that as well, then, um, we, we can start with newer, newer agencies that just simply don't have the types of powers and resources that allow them to be as out of control as they are. But that should not be taken as a denial that the border itself will, um, does generate violence because that is very true. Okay, um, thank you for the responses there. We have a couple of questions in the chat and uh, I don't see any raised hands yet. So shall we go to the questions in the chat? Um, let's see, there was one up above. I got to scroll up. Uh, Brian Rich uh, poses, I haven't read the book, but do you touch on all the other forms of illegal behavior? Employees, hiring, landlords, renting, coyotes, trafficking, fake document providers, et cetera, that are connected to undocumented immigrants. So maybe a little more about um, the scope of yeah, so I I don't spend that much time talking about that, but I do think a lot about kind of um, outsourcing of federal responsibilities in general, um, and the fact that like there's a long history in the United States that goes back um, to the very early years of the country in which out the work of enforcing immigration laws um, or free movement restrictions was outsourced and um, it's kind of, it's like a tough line to walk because on the one hand, the outsourcing is a problem in the sense that we're all being turned into agents of the federal government who are expected to inform um, on people or to turn people in or, you know, in the case of local law enforcement to, um, respond positively to detainer requests, things like that. And, um, you know, those are opportunities for us to resist, but they become harder to resist as, as those sets of um, demands are, are themselves better enforced. I, I don't think most of the uh, basis for the enforcement is very justifiable. So in that sense, I don't think there's much of a distinction in the justifiability of asking an employer to enforce versus asking an ICE agent to enforce. Both of them are problematic. Um, and and the, the only thing I'll say is I've been pleased to see, you know, to be living in a city and to see other cities turn um, their energies toward resisting those requests and in so doing, stating a commitment to principle of the rights human rights and the rights of people um, who weren't born in the United States to, to be able to live here. Okay, um, so we have a few more questions um, from Ruby Johnston. Sorry if this is a late question or if this was mentioned before, but uh, Ruby would like to know your opinion on the Farm Workforce Modernization Act that was passed by the House. 
Um, I'm just, I'm wondering if you can ask your question more specifically, like what about it you want to know? Ruby, um, you can um, come on, right? Um, and 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 answer, address the question. There we go. You found a way in. <laughs> sure. Hi. Um, I was kind of more wondering about like the controversies with the e-verify system that's like connotated to the um, Farm Work Modernization Act. Because I know okay. um, it poses some questions just between relations between employees and employers. And I was just wondering if you had any insight on that. Yeah, okay, so I wasn't sure if we were going to be talking about like selective regularization or enforcement. Um, and like, I, in a way, I think, I think what I said prior, um, I, I will say about this, which is like, I, I really um, don't think that we should be looking to ask employers to be enforcement agents. Um, but I also think that it does provide opportunities for resistance in some cases. Um, you know, I, I think like a lot of the work, the research that I did into the technologies and um, the databases that keep track of people led me to believe that when we think we're doing a better job of tracking where people are or what their status is um, or when they need to, to leave the country or work authorization, things like that. Um, just as soon as we think we've updated our technology, I think usually what we've done is create more opportunities for more authoritative enforcement um, against people who in some cases are rightfully there. But again, in general, I think we shouldn't be asked, we shouldn't be privatizing most of these functions. Okay, um, here's a question about differences from Jonathan Vukovic, um, differences at fixed border patrol checkpoints along the northern and southern border, especially racial prof racially profiling whom to stop, to question if the agents think the passing, uh, people passing through don't look like citizens, so. Okay. Yeah, so it's, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're, um, asking if there's profiling at the northern border. And I will just say if there's profiling at the northern border, <laughs> there's a lot of profiling at the northern border. And, um, you know, like, I think that the southern border just is more militarized, but Customs and Border Protection has gotten the budget for and authorization to purchase and has come in possession of a lot of military grade weapons. And, and you see these at the northern border as well as the southern border, even though there's a, a, a much more regular presence at the southern border. But like, to me, it was not a huge surprise when we saw um, in 2020 in um, Portland and in Minneapolis, we saw DHS drones and DHS agents grabbing people off the street um, surveilling, uh, sorry, the drones weren't grabbing people off the street, the agents were, but drones surveilling, like the tactics are, and the um, materials are federal and they're in both places. Um, the other thing we've seen is like, you know, the Northern border. So it's, one of the things I talk about in the book is uh, the fact that um, DHS has these uh, special exemptions carved out from what are otherwise Fourth Amendment requirements um, and restrictions placed on law enforcement agents. So um, that creates opportunity for, this isn't a fixed um, border uh, patrol question, but it, 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 I think it's still relevant to what you're asking. Um, in terms of like surveilling and entering property, uh, there's lots of property on the northern border that gets surveilled and entered all the time. And some of it falls under the Fourth Amendment um, carve outs for CBP and some of it actually doesn't. So I know that you see more stories from journalists written up about Customs and Border Protection kind of pushing right up against the limits of their powers or going over those limits at the southern border because there's just more volume and it's where people's attention is focused. But um, there's lots of areas in the northern border where you also see CBP going on people's property, 
surveilling, setting up cameras, um, trying to do like their own little sting operations. So I think there's more, there's, there's more in common than there are differences, I think. It's a really great question, um, but I, I think they're actually CBP is CBP wherever you go. Okay, David has a question, Henry's. Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks very much for the book, which I've not yet had a chance to read, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'll start a question about privatization and to what extent is your objection rooted in political philosophy or do you also have <laughs> empirical evidence that privatized detention, for example, leads to more abuses than uh, a detention by government forces? Um, so we have evidence of a lot of um, abuse on the part of like private detention facilities. And in the book, I do go through like some really representative instances of privately run youth facilities and then privately run prisons and uh, ICE prisons and the ways in which we see high levels of abuse there. Um, you know, I think that the problem is a little bit bigger in scope than just like, are they, are they worth? So um, I didn't, do a calculation of like, are there more abuses in private facilities than in publicly run facilities in part, you know, because people are moved around a lot. Um, and I think that you could do that, but I would have a lot of questions about the, you know, what that would involve. Um, but the thing about the private facilities is that it, it creates this very likely incentive or very strong incentive for um, harsher enforcement because the contracts usually are contracts for like, you know, heads and beds. And so there's um, new work coming from, um, uh, I think this study is just starting from Angelina Godoy at University of Washington that I think is gonna try to demonstrate on a larger scale, what she demonstrated in a pilot study, which is um, that it's not so much that we create these, or like have these contracts and create these opportunities um, for private enforcement because there's just too much for the federal government to do or because they're more efficient. Um, in fact, like they get perpetuated because the contracts themselves incentivize more enforcement. Um, so I, I, I think that lens is one of the most useful ways to think about it. As long as we have private companies that have money, you know, want to earn money, then they're going to ensure that uh, um, there's a lot of enforcement activity happening. When you look at the lobbying numbers, like the amount they spend lobbying in the 2000s when the buildup starts is just like, it just goes from very little to immense amounts of money flowing into lobbying um, for essentially so that they can keep their contracts and get more contracts. Okay, um, I think it's Roger next with a question and then Nathan Sharon, if you'd like to come on and ask your question when Roger finishes. It seems that would be great. Roger, you're muted. Thank you very much. It's a really very interesting and stimulating uh, talk, and I have a variety of questions. I'm going to only pose two, and then I'll get back to you separately with email. But so I have two questions, one, I guess, bigger picture, one a, a bit smaller, but the two are related. So I was very struck when you said that uh, we're all responsible for the problem that you've identified. But then you kind of took that in a direction I didn't anticipate. What I thought you would say was that we're all responsible because we all believe in migration control and that m much of the, many of the problems and much of the violence that uh, we find is inherent in the process of migration control because it entails an unacceptable uh, constraint on human freedom. But you didn't go that way. In the end, you said that uh, you put the burden, you, you, you put the burden on the defenders of the existing uh, system of, of border control, but it, or migration control, but it seems to me that you know migration control is a, uh, a constituent feature of the state system. It exists everywhere, and so uh, one one could ask a, a, a kind of thought of experiment. So 
I mean, and, and that migration control as practiced in the United States, of course, reflects all of the terrible aspects of US society. That is a, it's a much more militarized, more police, more brutal society than m many of the other uh, advanced societies around us that also practice migration control. So could one ask the thought experiment? Let's, let's, let's say that one could transplant the best aspects of less brutal uh, and, and more open system of migration control, let's say the Canadian or the Swedish, and one could somehow or another implant that onto the United States. And now, of course, that system would have to take, would, would have to deal with some of the consequences of, uh, of both uh, the inherent features of the, uh, of the United States, that is where it's located, the fact that it's a 2000 mile border with a less developed society with still poorer societies to the south of that country. Uh, as well as the fact that it has a history of so much migration. But would, how much better would that be if somehow or another we could turn the United States into Canada and Sweden? Would that, would that, would that be an acceptable limitation on human freedom as far as you're concerned? And how would you justify that? So that's question number one. And question number two is in some ways related. And that is, it seems to me that, I mean, that that and in and, and a way this is reflected in your talk that there's a consistent divide between what to do about the inside and what to do about the outside. And your policy recommendation, I mean, your, your focus is about the inside registry, but that leaves open the question of what to do about the outside, what to do about those people who would love to come to the United States for whom the coming to the United States would make life much better, but can't currently come in. And one of the arguments that is out there in the literature and that I think is relevant to your concern is the following. Uh, the Americans, like people all over the world, are resistant to more immigration. And that means that uh, the people who would benefit from migration can't, at least they can't to the extent that would be good for them. So wouldn't an acceptable compromise be to actually have larger and more effective programs of temporary migration, as long as one can pe keep people circulating, as long as you let people work in the United States for three, six, nine, four, 12 years, uh, well, that does a tremendous amount of good for their families. And in fact, it's consistent with what they wanna do themselves. So of course they can't become citizens, but if you could manage such a program successfully, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be a significant improvement over what we currently have and would be an acceptable uh, compromise between uh, the citizens' preference for closure and uh, the advantages of greater human mobility. So those are two big questions. I apologize for putting them <laughs> on your plate. No, we, should, we should be asking big questions. Um, so would we be better if we were Canada or Sweden? Um, you know, I assume... Sorry, would go ahead. Be better, but would it be acceptable to you? Of course, we'd be better if we were. But would that be an <laughs> acceptable constraint on human freedom as far as you're concerned? That's my question to you. I mean, right now, I think we're in the position of having let people choose things that, as you say, um, aren't actually in their interest uh, as our main set of policy. Um, policies towards migration. And so like, um, would, would it be acceptable to me to have something like a point system? Um, I, I have some, I have doubts about point systems. I mean, I think that the, the idea that like, um, whether it's high skilled migration, which kind of bleeds into your second question, or um, which, you know, like highly paid job migration, or other ways in which we force people to prove that they're of value to a society they're about to enter, there be, there's like a pretty big discrepancy between the way we're treating citizenship for people who, who get it automatically and then people who are asking for it, that it's, it's like pretty hard to justify. Um, so saying you have to be useful or have skills or the number of other things for which people um, can get points in a point system uh, doesn't, to me, it, I don't find particularly appealing. Um, and so the question then becomes like the, the bigger challenge um, that you started with, which is, is our border controls um, 
something that we have to have. And, you know, we started our, we start our um, modern border patrol and kind of border enforcement system with probably a stronger commitment to what was coming over the border than just who was coming over the border. Like we start with arguments about, a lot of arguments about contraband and vice behaviors. Um, and I kind of was, you know, played with in the book, uh, in writing the book, the idea that maybe we would be much better off if we simply worked on the idea that we were gonna keep some stuff out and stopped trying to keep people out for a while and see what happens. Because right now, anyway, I don't think we're in the position where we would be um, necessarily worse off if we stopped you know, letting people into the country. Then the question is on what basis do we let people into the country if we simply let everybody who wants to come into the country come? Um, do we let them in on like you're saying temporary work visas, but maybe you also want to include temporary protected status in that. Um, and I won't even like force you, compel you to commit to the, the kind of TPS that Maggie referenced in which it's like permanent TPS. But, you know, um, I think about this all the time. My first book uh, was on the idea that democracies have classes of people who never, um, get full rights of citizenship or people who cycle between um, having extensive rights and not having extensive rights. And temporariness is a really big part of that, whether it's um, being permanently on a three-year renewable visa or being allowed to come as part of some kind of like global redistribu redistributive program. And I think the obvious answer to that is like, well, this is not that good for people. It's like a little bit good, but not good for people who, who would really prefer to stay. But the less obvious thing is what, how, what do we call ourselves when we become a society in which we are really enthusiastically committed to the existence of a permanent semi-citizen, never will have rights class of people who, for whom there's not like really a good just, uh, justification with democratic theory for being um, disenfranchised. And, and like, that's gonna put us, you know, in a category <laughs> of politics that I, I think we don't really wanna be in. We are in that position. We have been in that position for a while. And the tranche of like the, the slice of people who are um, in the US on, this kind of um, indefinite temporary status grew right under Obama because of DACA, because DACA has no particular pathway to citizenship. Um, and I just, I just don't see how you look at people living large portions of their life somewhere, even if they're kind of, you know, coming back on renewable visas and say, this is something you can do and call yourself some kind of republic or democracy. So I'd be really loath to commit to that, to a, a, a lot of temporary visas, even if it does some redistributive work. Oh, okay, um, we have another a big picture question. Nathan's gonna come on and, uh, and ask his question. Hello, Professor Cohen. Um, I was an undergrad in one of your classes, The Politics of Citizenship, yes. a couple of years ago. Um, I remember you. So, so great to see you again. Um, my question is a bit more of a big picture question, and I completely agree with your argument that ICE and CPB and similar agencies make all of us less safe, not just those who are directly and disproportionately targeted, like undocumented immigrants, but I'm also wondering if you can speak about the close ties between U.S. law enforcement in the interior and immigration enforcement in other countries. Um, it's well known that the U.S. exports many of its law enforcement strategies abroad, leading to a dramatic increase in the militarization of police and borders around the world, and I think also exacerbating a lot of the crises we're facing, um, both you know, economic, um, crises of mobility and all of that. But I've recently read that the US has given $200 million to Mexico to fortify its borders between 2014 and 2019 to deter migrants from coming to the US border thereby giving tacit permission to use as much violence as may be necessary with you know, the caravan in 2018 kind of bringing that to 
you know, um, ahead. But such strategies of containment within the nation state or of offshoring enforcement to other countries is convincing me that perhaps we need a political and theoretical lens that moves beyond the state entirely. And I just think that in a lot of these discussions, not that I'm, you know, an expert, but it just seems to me that the way we talk about migration is as if it's very linear and not that there's a lot of circularity involved and people are constantly on the move. And I, I just think that I don't want to necessarily do away with borders entirely, but perhaps make them more porous and set up some kind of system, you know, but not one that necessarily has to be linked to a, an individual state. So I'm not sure, like, those are really big questions. You know, I'm still yeah. thinking about a lot of this stuff, but I'm just curious to know what you think. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's super nice to see a former student. Um, and so there's, a, there's kind of a theme in the last few questions about, like, how far we can push challenges to borders. That leads to challenges to state sovereignty and the state system more generally. And I do think, like, so I just brought up this idea of, why don't we try and control, you know, the stuff, but not people. Um, another way to think about this is why don't we put the onus? So I'm, I'm ultimately realist enough to say the state system, you know, we can imagine things beyond a state system, but the state system is not going anywhere, um, at least with respect to human movement not in the very near future. Um, we could start to think about putting the onus on the state to come up with better justifications for, um, for keeping people from moving. And um, so perhaps something like, a, I know it's hard to imagine, but a global pandemic, <laughs> uh, sorry, that's redundant, a pandemic would actually be a justifiable assertion of, um, the state, uh, the state and state power to stop movement, at least on a temporary basis. Whereas like your country's visa limit has been reached to maybe a little bit less justifiable and, um, and start to demand better justifications for keeping people from moving, which would in turn address your, um, the thing you bring up, which is enclaving, right? The idea that borders tend to force people to stay in place and what they wanna do is um, be able to travel back and forth from lots of different places. You started your question with reference to the fact that the U.S. exports lots of its techniques and a lot of resources as well to do border control work, in some cases on behalf of the United States, and in some cases just on behalf of the idea of um, holding people in place because it is something that, that um, seems desirable to states at least um, uh, all other things being equal. And right, we're not just doing this, we, like we have long-standing arrangements with Mexico. And in fact, I, I think one of the things I, I highlight in the book or I bring up in the book is the fact that when we initially started really building a border patrol, um, Mexico was an extremely enthusiastic participant because they didn't want a lot of the people who were leaving Mexico to leave knowing that those people would then be more likely to be stuck in the United States because they couldn't simply cross the border um, fluidly as people had done um, before border patrol became really serious business. But like, so it was like, there was a mutual advantage arrangement there in which we were collaborating. Um, now, uh, there's, it's less clearly just mutual, mutual advantage. Although in some cases, I think Mexico has been an enthusiastic participant in, in, in um, preventing mobility, but we're also involved at least rhetorically in this idea that we're going to somehow um, correct the sources of instability in Northern Triangle countries that are causing people um, to, to migrate, to have to leave and seek asylum in the United States. And, uh, I kind of wonder to myself, can we possibly uh, compensate for the damage that we did? Because um, a lot of the instability, economic instability and, um, and violence is US origin, right? It has to do with uh, exploitive arrangements that the US government was a part of in some cases. And then the fact that we deported people from prisons in the US where they had become members of US gangs that flourished in, um, in Northern Triangle countries. So uh, 
I am leery of us doing more because in the past, mostly the ways in which we've um, become involved in this kind of like remote control operation have uh, like made things worse for everybody, for the people who are nativists, for people in other countries who may have interests at stake either in staying where they are or in leaving. Um, just no good seems to come of those particular strategies. So yeah, thank you for that question. Well, uh, I'd like to see if anyone, if there's any other questions. Otherwise, I was going to try to formulate another big picture question. <laughs> um, so let me get take a stab at that. Um, you know, it strikes me you give us a perspective on the contemporary situation, and it is grounded in this historical over the last hundred years former attempts to do this registry or the version of the pathways to citizenship. Um, is a hundred years enough of, I mean, what, what would it mean to think beyond? <laughs> um, and, and I do very much wonder about, well, or, or even if time is, and I know you have another book that thinks about time, so the political value of it. So maybe there's a way of thinking about um, what time periods are we projecting to futures? Um, how do we address immediate, uh, the immediacy of these issues and see its development over time and project into the future. So when I project into the future, I think about climate change and I think about ecological um, change that is prompting new movements and, and maybe even opening up new, new um, spaces for people to move to. Um, how do we bring that big picture perspective? How would you bring it as a political scientist to think about the immediacy of how we make policy about border issues right now? Maybe yeah, it's not a fair question, but it's the kind. No, of it's totally fair. It's a good <laughs> question. Um, I mean, I think immediate, the immediate, the most immediate thing that we need to think about is um, uh, stopping our carceral and militarized approach to immigration, right? Because like um, we've got no evidence that even if even if you're like pretty nativist, you we've got no evidence that locking a lot of people up is doing anybody any good and we have lots of evidence that putting um putting weapons into the hands of people who are supposed to do border enforcement it doesn't change migration patterns um big migration numbers very much but it does like lead to lots of um things that no matter what side you're on even if what you want to do is say cvp is great it's like that's not actually making Border Patrol or Customs and Border Protection look pretty good. So I think like kind of moving um, to something at least before 1996 when we created the opportunity for mass incarceration of non-citizens, both people with, um, you know, uh, lawful permanent residents, um, people on short-term visas and people who were irregular uh, migrants like across the board, just what happened was a boon to a very few people, but not good for anybody else um, and serving no material or principled interest. So I think that's like the immediate question. When I think about um, the longer view, um, I don't disagree with you that climate change and ecological change are things we need to think about. You know, we, we are starting very belatedly, I think, really to study climate, um, make projections about climate change uh, migration. Uh, and we know like there are countries now that have had to secure new space for themselves because the sea level sea levels have made um, it impossible for their citizens to live there. Um, and I will say, I'm not like that particular Set of questions is not my greatest area of expertise um, and that I think long term we have to be thinking about um, particularly from the from within the United States we have to be thinking about about how we secure rights for people and um, so one thing that I think is interesting about and and like 
something good to say about the United States is the United States is really the first country where you see full naturalization embraced. So naturalization as it existed in European countries was never really like approaching full citizenship. Um, and it becomes a very different thing in the US very early on, right? 1790 is when we first start to do this thing where people can actually become full citizens with almost no distinction between a naturalized citizen and a native born citizen. And that was important because it, it was a statement of principle and uh, um, equality, but also for practical purposes, it was important because the idea was that this would actually attract people to the US we still need to attract people to the United States. Like, you know, I don't know if anybody's read the paper or listened to the news this week, but we are concerned about the future of the size of the population, the age of the population and the workforce and the population. Um, we're not doing ourselves any favors by catering to really misguided nativists, but, um, but we do have to be thinking about the fact that our tradition has been for really good reasons that people can acquire full citizenship and become full citizens that they don't, we don't have, we're not the Gulf states in the Gulf states model of like, you know, a huge proportion of the population are long-term non-citizens with very few rights. So I think, you know, moving away from the direction we've been going, which is a large population of people without full rights of citizenship is what we, at least in the medium to long term, should be thinking about. And that does draw in my other work on time, in which I talk about the fact that, you know, we tend to use time as a measure of people's um, process of becoming citizens, and that we could be doing that for people whose time right now has been devalued, right? People who've been in this country without authorization um, or with short-term visas in some cases for decades with, and that none of that time counts towards their political status um, right now, but we could change that. So that's where I, I go with that question. Yeah, thank you. I've enjoyed all the big picture questions that we've been grappling with a bit here. Do we have any other questions from our audience? I think we're about at time, so um, if there are no other questions, we'll conclude by thanking you for sharing with us this book. We'll look forward to, we, I don't know about everyone else, but I look forward to reading the full book. Was, the intro was a teaser. Um, thanks to Maggie for the comments. Thanks to all of you for um, coming out. And we'll have another session next week. Uh, Sophia, can you put that in the chat or anything they should know about that? Um, and yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maggie, for the comments and everybody for the invitation and for engaging and for coming back after we were <laughs> accidentally kicked off. <laughs> <laughs> Technological challenges, but it worked. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye now. Thanks.